All right, Janos, you can come on back. Okay, yes, uh, it's the top of the hour, so let's get started. Welcome to this uh, uh, .NET session at uh, ITF 117. Uh, I'm Janos Farkas, uh, uh, co-chair the working group with uh, Lou Berger, who is on site uh, with our secretary, Ethan Grossman, at the head table. And uh, I would like to thank uh, to Ethan for all the efforts uh, throughout uh, the working group. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, the work here at the ITF is uh, conducted uh, or governed uh, uh, by certain rules and policies, which are summarized in the note well. If you are not familiar with the note well, then please uh, check. Uh, it includes uh, pointers to BCPs and RFCs. And um, I would like to remind you that by participating, you acknowledge that your contributions, including uh, verbal contributions, become uh, part of the permanent record. Uh, we also have uh, contact guidelines. So uh, please uh, uh, follow appropriate behavior uh, with your colleagues. And um, I would like to make the same reminder, uh, Lumi, that uh, on site, uh, also please join uh, the Minteco for the uh, electronic uh, blue sheet and also for some uh, polls at the end and so on. I will stop video after talking and you get back the QR code. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask everyone to join uh, the note taking. Uh, I gave the link to the chat uh, too. Uh, it is a joint effort and uh, it's appreciated if you have uh, 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 taken care of the notes. Uh, we have two uh, sessions. Uh, this is uh, the first one, Wednesday. Uh, this is the DevNet session. And we also have another session tomorrow, a joint session between the Raw Working Group and uh, the DevNet Working Group in uh, one slot later. Uh, not, not session two like today, but session three. So you are welcome to join tomorrow as well. Uh, focusing on uh, uh, this ongoing session, we have a very packed agenda. Uh, the link is here. It is at the usual place. Please uh, check uh, if it didn't make sense to copy it over. But um, I would like to ask uh, presenters that uh, for working group authors, please uh, focus on, uh, on the changes uh, compared to the last meeting. What are the plans to complete the document? Uh, and for uh, non-working group uh, contributions documents, please focus on what uh, aspects of the charter you are addressing, uh, uh, for new drafts a summary of the new details, and for old drafts a comparison of what's new compared to previous uh, version. Uh, we will enforce the time. Uh, this includes a uh, discussion. Uh, just an update of, of, on the working group status. We have a number of drafts for which publication is, has been requested. The Yang uh, OEM framework, MPLS OEM, and uh, actually the IP OEM is getting there. Uh, Shaper's write-up is uh, uh, the next step before that. And uh, two new drafts at that stage is the packet ordering function and the MPLS over IP PO. Uh, I would like to also uh, mentioned the ongoing open working meetings on the enhanced data plane, but there will be more details provided on that. Uh, we were copied on the liaison exchange between ITP uh, uh, 802.1 and ITUT study group 13. Uh, this was just a carbon copy, no action needed from our side. And uh, we would like to remind you our IPR policies and also that uh, uh, the work is primarily conducted on the list. That's why we build consensus. So please use the list. We can have virtual meetings like the regular meetings on the uh, enhanced data pane and we can set up additional uh, meetings as needed. Uh, just don't hesitate to ask uh, us. Okay, uh, and we can uh, move to the next uh, one, which is uh, an update from uh, David. David, are you? Yeah, I'm okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so this is an update uh, from the open working meetings. Uh, 
uh, on the enhanced .NET data plane. Next slide. So we've had seven meetings since uh, IATF 116 Yokohama. Each meeting has a two-part agenda. We've uh, process-oriented topics, requirements, draft contents, evaluation, uh, stuff, uh, act uh, topics that will help move uh, the work forward, and then in-depth presentation of a queuing scheduling mechanism. This two-part structure has worked really well. Uh, the process-oriented outcomes, you've seen several revisions to the scaling requirements draft, which when we tried to use it, we discovered, oh, there's a few more things it ought to say or places where it wasn't as clear as we thought it was. There are also initial evaluations of TSN mechanisms against those requirements, and that's where a lot of those original scaling requirements uh, draft uh, came from. The initial evaluations are taxes slide deck. I'm not going to present them here uh, as we are really short on time. There was also an in-depth mechanism presentation each meeting. Uh, that's worked very well, giving uh, the folks who've designed a, a scheduling queuing mechanism half an hour or more to explain how it really works, as opposed to a really short 10-minute slot in one of these meetings uh, has proven beneficial. I think, I think a lot of people have learned quite a bit about uh, some, some of what's uh, going on. Next slide. So uh, what are we going to do between now and ITF 118? Um, need to move evaluation of the uh, TSN mechanisms to evaluation of proposed new mechanisms. Uh, the expectation is the draft authors for each new mechanism will prepare the initial evaluation and then we'll have discussion of the, of the evaluation. Uh, that should get us to a point of being able to talk about requirements coverage by mechanisms in meeting discussion uh, which ought to uh, start moving us towards what are the various sort of alternatives we could choose uh, to meet the scaling requirements. Proposed logistics. Uh, the 8 a.m. U.S. Eastern time slot seems to work better than the 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern time slot. I'm just going to move to that. Courtesy of my day job, we need to move. We need to do, the, do that time slot on Tuesdays rather than Wednesdays. Proposed first meeting is August 22nd, although I'll be happy to listen to requests and say, hey, people want to take all much of August off, wait till September. We do need to make sure that we don't try to meet on the Tuesday after the uh, U.S. holiday weekend, uh, the first weekend of September. Uh, and these meetings will be based on Meet Echo. We had an IETF WebEx failure, went to Meet Echo and haven't looked back. And that's all I intended to present. Comments, questions, discussion? Dead cats and rotten tomatoes? Xu Song, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, David. Uh, this is Xu Song from Huawei. Uh, just many thanks to lead the discussion. I think it, it helps a lot to make people know more about the mechanisms on the table. Uh, some uh, proposals about uh, the, the next plans for your consideration. Uh, the first thing is that I, I noticed that because the queuing mechanisms is really um, a very big or a very um, have a lot of variation about a lot of queuing mechanisms. So there are still uh, many new uh, individual documents coming out to to show that there are a lot of interest to um, to introduce new mechanisms in the networking group. Um, but um, a little concern about um, maybe the, the, the it will make the discussion more complex and endless. So um, a little proposal is that can we consider to class, uh, classify the existing QE mechanisms? For example, the, the asynchronized QE mechanisms, uh, cycle-based mechanisms, and uh, um, queue space, the mechanisms like that, that maybe make the discussion more focused on the classification. Because if we looking at the uh, academ uh, academic uh, contributions in the field, there are a lot of um, queue mechanisms. So I think it's um, very, um, very hard for the Dana working group to consider them all. That is the first proposal for your consideration. Uh, hope it works. A uh, second one is also um, related to the first uh, uh, observation because the QE mechanisms is really a lot. So um, I think the evaluation is really important. And uh, as you mentioned, there will be a um, you know evaluation for each QE mechanisms to make people discuss whether it is valid or not. And um, maybe we can also consider to um, uh, let e each 
uh, document orders to also provide the, the detailed uh, comparison between the, the mechanisms they raised and the mechanisms of the existing uh, of the existing work, for example, the IEEE work and also the academic work. I think that will make people more clear what has been um, uh, been been worked to make it more scalable or to more suitable for that net uh, scenario. That is just two comments from my side. Thanks. Thank you. Classification, it certainly sounds interesting. Is there an existing classification that we could use? I hesitate to spend a lot of time designing our own classification. Uh, David, you mean uh, you have uh, already have some classification a proposal? No, in, I'm in... asking whether I'm asking whether you know of one because I think if we ask uh -huh. the participants in the working group to devise one, we'll have five competing classification structures. And that, not, <laughs> yeah, not, I understand. Sure, I like that idea. <laughs> I I think maybe IEEE work can be a, a clue because there there is some you know IEEE existing work and uh, I think they face similar situation so maybe we can seek suggestions from Janos or other people from IEEE uh, whether they can give some clue about how to class, uh, classify these mechanisms. Please send mail to the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah sure yeah uh, perhaps also it's a. Uh something for discussion in the um, regular meeting is to ask the authors to suggest how they would classify themselves and maybe there'll be some nice self-synchronization. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> okay, and uh, I'll t she's on, I, let's see. Um, I heard your, your, your other comment about asking authors to make comparisons and uh, sounds interesting. I'll think about that. We can certainly uh, discuss that further in, uh, in in the open meetings. Uh, David, anything else? I think you have some uh, backup material. I don't know if it's worth just flipping through, not discussing it, just letting the working group know that there's a summary. Yeah. Yeah, John. If you, if you want a quick quick flip through the backup slides, these are the slides um, that uh, were prepared as an issue evaluation of the TSN mechanisms. They're intended for reference only. We've uh, talked. To, if, if we start talking about them, I'll consume half of Lou's avail Lou and Janice's uh, available meeting time, and uh, I don't think they'll forgive me for that. But it's good to know that it's there. If you're interested in sort of a summary of all the um, more detailed discussions we're going to have uh, for the rest of the session. Here's a one slide summary on each of those topics. You can just go download it, take a look. And the other thing is you'll see across these slides there's a common framework of how we're, uh, we're evaluating mechanisms against the requirements draft. This is what's going to be expected for all of the new proposed mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Peng, who's I believe is going to be remote. Just one more comment what? for the previous presentation. Is Go ahead. That allowed? It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, ju just uh, I think many thanks to to David. It it is really not an easy job. It's two week discussion and a very long and a difficult. And I think uh, David's job is really work is really useful and helpful. Thanks. And Shu Song, I want to return the thanks as I think you are the person I remember the most for suggesting that we make time in the meetings for the in depth presentations, which was a really good idea. And thank you for all, all your contribution, both David Shuzang and all the other authors. Thank you. So we're going to move forward. Well, can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, Pony from China Mobile, and it's a requirement for scaling uh, deterministic network. Next slide, please. So uh, this document describes uh, technical requirements and the data plan enhancement requirements. It was updated to 03 version according to the discussion in the bi-weekly interim 
and really thanks to everyone who contributed to that to uh, this document. We add some new requirements with some changes of the structure uh, and some analysis of the related TS method in the text. Moreover, some of the solution draft has evaluated themselves according to the requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the main updates for, um, from their one version to the current version. Uh, in section 3.2, we add some words about the bandwidth utilizations. It is about CQF, the pro, um, propagation delay is part of the dead time imposed in a cycle, which impacts the bandwidth utilization. And in section 3.4, uh, we change the title to be scalable to the large number of flows and tolerate high utilization and uh, add some text to describe the high utilization and uh, uh, analyze the traffic class. Um, for the high utilization of uh, scaling DenNet, the traffic that requires uh, then the service can significantly uh, fill up the capacity of a link or the portion of the link which is uh, dedicated to such traffic. For example, more than 75% um, and or up to near 100% utilization. Um, the, in this case, the over provisioning of link capacity doesn't work. Uh, it is require uh, uh, scalable queuing solutions to improve the bandwidth utilization. And for the uh, analysis of traffic class in QBV, it uses traffic class to divide the flows and uh, number of it is usually eight, so that the forwarding mechanisms itself isn't uh, complex with a large number of flows or higher aggregation. However, when adding new flows, the gate control list may be changed, so the recalculation is more complex. There might be a method to simplify the calculation or configuration, which needs more work to enhance it. And for uh, section 3.5 and 3.6, we exchanged the order of them because one of the potential reasons of uh, flag, uh, flow fluctuation is uh, traffic steering caused by topology, topology change. Um, so the main text change are uh, in section uh, 3.6 and 3.7. We removed from this serving service of the section title and abstract some points which might cause uh, flow fluctuation based on the text and the discussion to make it clear. And in section uh, 3.7, we add a new requirements be scalable to a large number of hops with complex to, uh, topology. For most of the applications, the bounded latency is a constant, so the uh, scalability of the queuing mechanisms is quiet. And uh, for the last uh, requirement in section three, we change the title to support multi uh, mechanisms in single demand and multi demand, considering other subsections in this section are also for the queuing mechanisms. Uh, so we remove the queuing mechanisms in the turtle. Um, and in section four of the uh, data plan, we uh, delete section 4.3 uh, and 4.4, .4, since there is no direct mapping items in section three. Uh, and uh, there are some reference for added so next slide, please. So here's an overview of the technical requirements in current version, and I won't talk too much uh, here, but for the potential discussion of the structure, if there would be. Next slide, please. Um, so the last two slides show the main text change of the requirement. Um, six and requirement seven. Uh, here are five points uh, abstracted the potential reason to cause a flow fluctuation. And one is the virus and the massive traffic flows of different application in scaling 
network easily caused uh, more birthday traffic, and there will be more aggregation nodes which receives uh, flows from more upstream nodes, adding the non-deterministic delay of the packet tra treatment. And the burst of flows can be uh, accumulated as uh, flow uh, uh, travels join and uh, separate over hops. And the loops formed in the uh, uh, network topology increase uh, uh, max, uh, max, uh, maximum uh, burst of the flows. And the node and link failures are more common in a large uh, network. So next slide, please. And for requirement uh, seven, be scalable to a large number of hops with complex topology. So the first paragraph is to see that the network topology can uh, also be complex. It is required to support the uh, network with uh, such virus type of uh, topologies and uh, large hop count. And the second par paragraph is to clarify the scalable. Um, originally, we had two aspects, one is keeping the bounded latency with a, a variety of hops, that's wrong. Another is keeping the queuing parameter with a, a variety of hops, um, which require a good scalability of queuing mechanism. However, consider, considering the bounded latency of the application is always a constant, so we just recommend the first point. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next step is to refine document and uh, coordinate with a solution document for uh, evaluation. And uh, I think one point that is not mentioned is about uh, bounded data. They were talked in the last um, meeting and also related to the clock drift issue. Uh, we will add some text, but not sure uh, to be a new requirement in section three since the latency data and the packet loss are the three basic indicators of, of, of the net. So once to uh, evaluate the solution, um, they are the basic requirements. And uh, thanks, any comments? If you can scan in, please use the queue, that's better, but it's all right, you're at the mic, just go, but in saying for others. I can go do it. You, 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 can, you can go, but uh, just in general. Sorry, I'm not familiar with the new process here. Yeah. Um, name. My name is Glenn Parsons. I'm with Ericsson. Um, the uh, the question I have on uh, the requirements here um, is um, I'm not seeing a use case. Uh, I mean, there's great requirements on how a large scale network needs to be this big and needs to have these requirements. Um, but what's this for? Um, I'm familiar with the activity in 802.1 and TSN where we're doing uh, deterministic networking for AVB, or for audiovisual bridging, for industrial automation in a factory, for aerospace in an airplane, um, for automotive in, in a vehicle. Uh, it's not clear to me what the, what the application that is driving these requirements are. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Uh, it is uh, come out with uh, um, scaling, uh, scaling um, uh, hopes and scaling uh, traffic and uh, crossing demand. And uh, your question is about the use case, I think. Um, in the scaling uh, then that we think there will be more use cases, but that's uh, is not defined in this document. Uh, for instance, I think the, some emerging uh, use cases like the ARVR and the, the cloud gaming, which also uh, requires uh, deterministic latency. I'd also suggest taking a look at the uh, current document. I wouldn't call it a use cases document, it's a requirements document, but it does talk a little bit to the use cases Take a look, see if you have comments, please send them to the list. Uh, Kiran? Hi, I'm Kiran from Futureway. Um, I have a question on your requirement six, um, a clarification question that 
what do you mean by flow fluctuation? Is it just the dynamic entry and exit of the flows or is it more than that? Uh, because if it is just entry and exit of the flows, I, pref I would prefer if we use a different terminology than fluctuation. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I think it's one reason uh, to cause uh, flow fluctuation, um, but there are also other reasons uh, because the flows <laughs> won't be um, so uh, regular uh, as, uh, as a uh, local network. I think this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this is a good topic also for the list. If you have a, some specific alternate wording you'd like to propose, I think that'd be great to see on the list and see, see how it's received. Uh, totally second. Um, so the one thing as a co-author, and we had this already just for, for the notes here, um, relating to the application, I think the biggest differentiation between the different applications that we see is whether they need uh, also low jitter or not, and we need to somehow escalate the jitter requirement that in our ad hoc evaluation, it, it shows up as a, as a separate line item, which I think is a key for a subset of the applications. With respect to the applications overall, yeah, I mean, we've been starting to use examples which we don't have in our use case uh, RFC, and so I, I would also raise the big question of how do we, you know, progress with that, right? So maybe have a BIS, let it stand around, and if people want to contribute new chapters, I, don't, I mean, so this remote driving, of course, is my favorite pet topic. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to write up something, but I'm not sure if we want to do something on that front. Um, so any suggestions from the group would be nice in that respect. Sure. Uh, keep in mind, we're contribution driven. So if you think we need an update that cover that captures use cases, uh, do it as an update. I don't think we need to do abyss. Um, okay. We can just say, here are some more. Okay. Uh, if you think that's useful and the group think it's useful, then we'll, yeah. we'll progress it. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if well, the feedback anytime on the list or so from Ethan, who has been had the trouble of uh, steering that zoo and being the editor, I, I probably want to catch up with you afterwards on that. Sure. So thanks. Uh, and with that, why don't you come to the front because you're the next speaker, I believe. Am I off one? We, sh we uh, told you that Lijou would be uh, giving that? Oh, sure. So that she didn't should get updated in the notes. She should be remote. So. Yep. Okay, no worries. Um, so. Hello. Yeah, this is Ijo speaking from the remote. Please go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. So uh, I'm going to have a very quick update on the TCQF draft. So we have uh, two version updated. The first one is from uh, version number 0203. Uh, basically, there, there, there were some detailed presentation for the mechanisms for both of the drafts talking about the CQF variations at the inter, uh, data interim meetings. And uh, um, thanks to Davy with, with his suggestion, we are trying, we were trying to merge both of the drafts because uh, they are trying, they were trying to use the same queuing mechanisms. So um, the 03 version uh, performed the merging for the text and the authors. And uh, so that uh, the new version of 03 uh, gives a detailed explanation of evolution from the conventional CQF to the tag, the cycle ID tag CQF. Uh, and uh, um, based on the discussion from the data in, in, the interim, uh, also we made the forwarding specifications independent of the encapsulations. And there are separate sessions now. Um, we have the MPLS for, uh, encapsulation and the IP and IPv6 with the DSCP as the um, as the um, what we call the short term um, short term uh, goal for for working with the IP. And also we added a new IPv6 option header. Uh, for the TCQF based, but for the uh, .NET IP data plane 
right now it's called the DIP option uh, via two possible extension header and also the IANA considerations for it. Next slide, please. Yeah, this slide actually talks about something uh, which is uh, independent from draft. Uh, in the interim, we show a, a, a demo uh, we had performed um, over the large scale, or over the WAN, which is as shown by the right hand side picture. It was in Chinese, but now it is in, available in English version. Um, so if you're interested, you are welcome to check this version. Uh, so this is the test bed for the high speed and the large scale network. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this slide talks about um, another revision after the merging of the two documents. Uh, this is from the zero, uh, version 03 to 04. Uh, we follow, uh, following the presentation of another CQF uh, relevant proposal called the CSQF. Uh, it, uh, it is uh, like uh, um, uh, used the very uh, used the similar concept similar concept for the uh, for the cycle ID based, uh, but uh, used the segment routing sets instead of the per hop mapping. Um, so uh, also another text another uh, a content revision is about after. Uh, after another review for the CQF, uh, here the CQF means the already public, the published CQF, which is 802.1QCH. Um, so we find out that CQF could support multiple independent instances of cycle buffers. Uh, TCQF can do the same, but we didn't specify it in the in the document. Uh, we haven't found whether we really need it or not. But uh, uh, so if needed, we can add it. So that's the uh, that's that's the revision from zero three to zero four. Next slide, please. Yeah. So we uh, the the authors of this um, documents thinks the draft is quite complete. Um, received the review and the validation both um, from the uh, DETNET interim meetings and uh, um, and from mailings and off and offline so there could be um, some other components that can work together with TCQF um, I'm pretty much sure that uh, Tallis will talk about more in later presentation regarding the frame interleaving. It is almost equivalent to the ingress policy, um, I think. And uh, um, uh, but that one, we think there are, there are two independent components from the uh, from the uh, architecture point of view. Uh, one is the TCQF, another is frame interleaving. So we separate them. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Any questions or suggestions on it? Okay, we can move to the next presenter, Shafu. Hi. Uh, how, uh, I have a, a, a small question uh, to T curve. Uh, it seems that the, uh, in, in order to improve resource utilization, uh, T curve should be combined with flow interleaving. Uh, the idea of flow interleaving originated from TS and TAS, uh, which relies on defining time slot resources in network devices. Uh, while TCCF will be used the queuing design concept of enhanced CCF, uh, which only contains a few queues, such as a typical three buffer mode, uh, that uh, make a flow interleaving difficult to achieve significant uh, efficient. Thank you. Uh, 
So we moved a little quickly. Sorry, I didn't catch that you wanted. I thought you were coming into queue to talk, not to respond, not to comment on the prior um, draft. So I don't know if uh, Torless or uh, um, if anyone would like to respond to previous draft authors to the comment. Okay. Okay. So Torless says he will cover it later. So he will uh, uh, hear your comment and uh, or he's heard your comment and we'll talk about it uh, when he talks next. Uh, so if you could uh, uh, continue with your talk now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, uh, this is Sir Fukan from Mozilla. Uh, I, I will uh, I represent the remote. Uh, for uh, please turn to the next page. Okay, for uh, for this version, we mainly contains the following updates. Uh, first, add more co-authors interested in the collaborating with this topic, and fully elaborate on the EDF scheme in IPMTS network, supplement the read controlled and solid queue based solution branches, and temporarily delete the content of runtime per hop and uh, give the definition of delay level resource with uh, control plane extensions, path calculations, and the deployment considerations of bus accumulation that uh, may happen in some solution branches. Please, the next page. Again, uh, this proposal is to find our potential query mechanism that the uh, much in larger scaling requirements based on the challenges of uh, existing mechanisms. Uh, we introduce EDF scheduling to determine the data plane to uniformly provide the bounded delay data by in time or on time mode. Next page, please. So, uh, uh, according to the research result of some papers, an EDF scheduler which always selects the packet with the shortest deadline for transmission uh, is an optimal scheduler for a bounded delay service. But the, 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 the precondition of, uh, for EDF to work properly is that uh, the traffic of any service flow must always satisfy the given traffic constraint function when it reaches a certain EDF scheduler. Uh, for example, uh, if the sorted queue is used, uh, the condition is like uh, uh, the, uh, the formula, I will not go detail. Uh, if the rotation polarity queue is used, uh, the condition is uh, like the below. Uh, next page, please. So for the update one, uh, uh, the solution of read control plus sorted queue, uh, it may use reshipping defined in RFC 2212 uh, or interleave the shipping de uh, defined in ATS and uh, a single pipe queue. Uh, because each flow is read controlled, so all flows arrived at EDF scheduler are uh, eligibility and uh, the schedulability condition is met. Uh, a packet is put to the pipe according to arrival time at the scheduler plus the allowable queuing delay. Next page, please. So for the update two, for the solution of read control plus RP queue, uh, this is the rotation polarity queue. Here, the difference is that uh, it may use rotation polarity queues each with uh, countdown time. The smaller the city, the higher the polarity. Again, the scalability condition is that a packet is put to the RPQ according to uh, city is less or equal to Q, and the Q is less than uh, city plus AT. Next page, please. Uh, for the solution of latency conversation plus sorted Q, the first is that the latency conversation is based on latency deviation, uh, we term it as E. Due to latency conversation, all flows arrived at the EDF scheduler are distinguished as eligibility or ineligibility. 
Eligibility parks are always scheduled first before the ineligibility park is. Uh, but it, it should be noted that the, the eligibility park is here also include those uh, have, uh, ha, ha, have changed from in eligibility to eligibility after uh, experience the punishment time. Uh, a packet is put to the pipe according to arrival time at the scheduler plus Q, all according to arrival time at the incoming port plus D plus E. Next page, please. Uh, Traditional EDF scheduling is uh, work concern. However, we can take untimer mode based on D and E. Untimer may be performed all only on egress. For the case of untimer performed, it may exceed the package deadline. Uh, but the well-designed queue or location rules or in queue rules may provide end-to-end -end bounded exceeding value. The jitter may be up to the delay level value. The benefit. Uh, for this case, it's uh, easy for buffer size design due to no bust accumulation. Uh, while for the case of untime only on egress, uh, it may still exceed the package deadline, also up to the delay level value due to concurrent arrivals. And uh, these arrivals have the same time uh, to send. This is difficult to handle. I hope that the, the amount of non aggregated flows facing the client side. Uh, it's small, uh, make the impact minimal. Next, please. Uh, the delay resource of a link can be represented as the corresponding bus and the bandwidth resources pool for each delay level according to the scalability condition based on AK bucket constraint function. Next, please. For the case of latency compensation, uh, with uh, in time mode, it should take care of bus accumulation. It is exactly like the bus accumulation of strict priority scheduling. Some paper give an evaluation method for this bus accumulation that can be used to design the buff design. Uh, next, please. Also, this table is the evaluation of the degree of matching between this proposal and the large scanning requirements. Uh, I, 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 I will not uh, discuss in detail because uh, there's no so many time. Next, please. So next, we will uh, uh, improve untimer performance function. And uh, uh, we think that the ETF is the right direction of enhanced uh, data play. So would like to request the WC or Dobson. Any questions that comments? Thank you. Okay, Susan. Uh, sorry, Shofu, I haven't uh, joined the discussion of the open uh, meeting for, for this document. I have to raise my concern here. I really have a lot of concern for this document. Uh, first is that, um, can you explain what have you done more than the reference you have listed in page, I think page two. It's, I think uh, the, the reference you have listed um, that which is published in uh, 1996 of the EDF mechanisms has a really detailed uh, description of um, the, the, the work. So uh, could you explain what's more on the, the reference? or just some implementation description? Uh, yeah. Mm, uh, um, uh, yes, the reference document uh, is a, a key uh, document that uh, we, uh, uh, we rely, we de depend on. Uh, the key difference that uh, we think uh, our course did needs uh, 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 for example, latency compensation uh, uh, that uh, can help us do it. Thank you. Um, actually, that is another concern. If you um, read the, the reference you have listed, that it is a very 
uh, very uh, solid assumption that then the flow uh, constraint in our hope has be um, you know inside the the the. Uh, the traffic specification that makes the every hop latency uh, exact, accepted or uh, can be calculated. And every claim in that reference have a very detailed proof of how to calculate the, the latency bound. But I noticed that in your document, the, the calculation is uh, highly simplified and there's no proof. And the, the latency uh, uh, concentration, I think it is invalid because if the uh, if the uh, if the traffic specification cannot be reshaped in every hop, there will be um, possible confliction between different flows, and the, the latency uh, ending more latency can just you know uh, help when the latency is uh, enough. If the latency has already been uh, you know over consumed, it, it is invalid. So I think um, maybe more detailed um, descriptions are really needed in this document. Thanks. Mm. Uh, okay, we, we, we just give a proof in the draft. Uh, please take a look at it. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I have reviewed the document. I think it's, it's, uh, it's far, uh, far from <laughs> enough. Uh, maybe we can have offline discussion, yeah. Please see the okay. reference. That that is the real uh, proof of the calculation. Thanks. Okay. Okay. All right. You're also the next speaker. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Please turn to the next page. Uh, so for motivations, uh, mm, yes. Uh, TS and TS are uh, introduced a single nose TDM method based on GCL. Gating cycle. Uh, the idea is that when the packets of the scheduled traffic arrive at a certain node, the node will turn on the green light for it. A gating cycle contains multiple variable length time slots, each for specific flows. However, TS requires time synchronization and has scalability issues and GCL calculation, update, and the installation. Uh, to meet the large scaling requirements, this draft enhanced TS to introduce time slot types of resources to layer three and the related time slot based scaling mechanism and the data plane. Next, please. So, uh, TGF will construct the, the time slot type of resources for each link for specific uh, or transition period instance. The resource of the orchestration period are opened and, uh, to the service, and uh, it is learns is related to the service bus interval. However, if a network device instantiates queuing resources according to the orchestration period, they require a large buffer size. For example, the number of long loading queues is large. So we decap the orchestration period from the scheduling period. The later matches the actual hardware capacity of the device requiring only a few long loading queues or a single pipe code. Then pass calculation is based on time slot resource reservation and each link and obtain a flexible mapping relationship between the incoming time slot and the outgoing time slot on each node. Uh, and the data plane map or transition pair with the time slots to scheduling pair with the time slots and access time slot resource without the conflicts. Next please. Uh, the first step is to determine the angle in sending time slot when the flow arrives at the node. This, uh, this is necessary for the outgoing time slot reservation to get an expected evaluation of resistance delay. The following two figures show that the, how to obtain the outgoing sending time slot and the head end all of, and the transit node. Assuming that the service flow periodically reaches the network entry, after traffic regulation, each subbust of the bus interval has an ideal position relationship within the orchestration period. Based on this ideal position, we can obtain the ongoing sending time slot for this subbust. Next, please. The controller 
may maintain a reservation subtask for each subbus that may be multiple subbus in the service bus interval, and each may consume a different time slot. Firstly, and the third and for each subtask, allocate a fixed outgoing time slot G0 plus O0 according to the idea allow position G0 of that subbus within the attribution period. Then the fixed outgoing time slot of the head and the load will map to a fixed ongoing time sending time slot G1 and downstream load and continue to allocate a fixed outgoing time slot G1 plus O1 and the transfer load and so on till and, till the end point. Uh, there is a basic observation or assumption that the, the, the subpass that does not arrive randomly at any node. This is a precondition for time slot resource reservation based on the idea position. Next, please. Uh, however, the real arrival position within the attribution period uh, may have some deviations. Packet should be matched to the subbus state whose outgoing time slot follows closely behind the, the real arrival position. If the real arrival position is completely random, uh, it is difficult to allocate the time slot. In this case, more work is necessary. The first option is that the, on the incoming port of the network entry, an explicit buffer can be placed before the TGF schedule to store packets to, to get the fixed arrival position. Or the second option is to let the scheduling period equals to or children period to directly store packets in the queuing subsystem. In any options, Actually, delay may be introduced and the control plane does not avoid it. Next, please. So this is about uh, to construct the time slot resources of a specific orchestration period instance of the link. Each link has its own time slot resource information, which include uh, time slot length, orchestration period length, scheduling period length, for each time slot within the orchestration period, it continues to include the maximum reservable past and the unreserved past. A possible past calculation method may be to maintain budget for each subtask and not the summary of all nodes residence evaluation must meet the total residence budget. Next, please. Uh, so in the data plane, the packets will always carry time slot, for example, J of orchestration period. As mentioned before, each node instantiates the queuing resources according to the scheduling period. So it needed to map time slot J of orchestration period to time slot J single code of scheduling period. For long loading queue, if the constraint O less than M is always followed during reservation proceeding. The mapping rule is simple. Uh, that is, J single code equals to J mode M. For sorted queue, a packet is put to the queue according to the arrival time of the scheduled plus O. Typho can apply in time or on time mode. So the end to end delay is like the following formula uh, that contains the delay of on time and delay for in time. Next, please. Uh, traditional traffic regulation per flow is still placed on the ingress node. Uh, in addition, return state for each subbus of the flow, since different subbus may consume different time slot. Next, please. So we have a global time slot uh, style volumes. Uh, when volume nodes have the same time slot length, for the same orchestration period instance, and I don't want to maintain trivial mapping states per pass, per pass. Global time slot may be useful. The key feature is that the incoming time slot I will always reserve, time, uh, re, re, reserve outgoing time slot I. Next, please. So uh, this table is the evaluation of ticker for matching the large scale requirements. Uh, well, I will not uh, also describe it in detail. Next, please. So next, we will uh, 
supplement uh, multi-terrain uh, pyrophase queen and introduce internal mode to approximate TAS cut through behavior. Any questions and comments? Uh, hi, Shofu, this is Xu Song. Um, actually, I noticed that in your previous uh, slides, you also mentioned that you will end the PIFO um, contents. Actually, I, I noticed in your previous document, you have already ended this part. But I strong, uh, strongly suggest do not do that because the, the PIFO, as I know, there is no hardware in any router or switch can support this or, or our existing uh, device can only support FIFO. So the, the, the PIFO is kind of, um, I think, academic implementation. Um, so I think it's not really practical uh, in our scenario. Yes, thank you. Uh, we just to provide a solution for uh, Operators can uh, select uh, uh, based on the real scenario. Thank you. Uh, yeah, th that is the first comment. And the second comment is that uh, thank you for listing uh, SESQF as the reference. But I have already mentioned in our uh, open DENNAP meeting, I think that the difference between the, the SESQF and then this document is still not very clear. So if you have and the more uh, contents about this part will be very helpful. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I will uh, send a more detailed uh, uh, response uh, in my list. Uh, Dan Bogdanovich, so it depends how you implement the data plane. I am uh, not a proponent of using uh, the big vendor data planes because they don't give enough flexibility. A P4 data plane is much more suitable for activity, that net, uh, activities than from some of the vendors. Last time I looked, P4 didn't have great queuing support or e easily implemented queuing. So I'd be really interested. It. I'd be really interested in if you could send a good reference to the list that that supports your statement. Yeah, I'm serious. Thank you. And would be great if we could have the discussion one of the interns when we have more time because I'd love yeah. to. Okay. Next one. Go. All right. So um, this is um, another proposal from our side called GLBF. Uh, next slide. So uh, we had a detailed um, uh, presentation about this last week in the interim and uh, the pointers here for uh, the slides and the recording are there. So what I'm trying to do here in the working group slot is to focus on the questions uh, that were raised during um, that uh, presentation and uh, which is pretty much, um, you know, new slides that, that just focus on that high level. Next, next slide. Okay, so um, what is GLBF? GLBF is the TSN ATS solution um, with dampers as opposed to interleaved regulators. And again, high level, right? So I'm not going to go into all the details, but if you're trying to have opinions in here, that those are the type of things you'll have to read up on anyhow. So next uh, slide. So this is basically TSN ATS for routers showing um, you have two stages there. One is just simple priority queuing, FIFOs uh, with uh, priority scheduling. That is the beautiful piece of uh, UBS TSN ATS makes it extremely simple to calculate the per hop bounded latency, but then to maintain that over multiple hops, there is a, an element called the per flow shaper. And that per flow shaper is basically ensuring that whenever on uh, hops uh, um, flows are colliding, that they get, you know, corrected again that on every hop you can calculate a very simple latency which I'm showing there to be uh, equal to or less than L1, L2, L3 for the three hops so you just add them up your controller becomes beautifully easy um, and so we call this in time because when you don't have any competing traffic the queuing latency per hop is zero when you've got the maximum amount of competing traffic the queuing latency per hop is that guaranteed pre-calculated maximum L1 L2, L3, and in time, of course, you can come as early as you like, but you'll never leave uh, later than what's guaranteed. Next slide. So in 
uh, GLBF, we're now using the damper. And the damper, what it is doing is simply um, using the beauty of, we can do packet headers, we can measure how long you actually stayed in the queue. And when you stay shorter than the maximum guaranteed latency, that delta of time is put in a packet as a header. And on the next uh, hop, it is being delayed so that you are actually from the start of the queuing up to the end of the damper on the next hop exactly uh, being delayed by that guaranteed latency. And so that uh, easily can uh, be understood to have exactly the same calculus as UBS, only that now you're not in time anymore. You're not as early as possible, but you're on every hop accurately the guaranteed pre-calculated latency. Uh, we call that on time. Next slide. So why? Next slide. So this is kind of what you would have to have in a big service provider network to make this work, right? So we have a controller that does all the good things, but then you have on every hop the necessity for every flow um, to um, download provision and then per uh, packet processing uh, update um, the shaper state. Right? And this is the stuff that we hate. This is why we killed RSVPTE and replaced it uh, with segment routing to get rid of this per hop signaling and per hop per flow, uh, very expensive processing. Next slide. This is the detail, right? So this is the wonderful um, state table and worse yet uh, in comparison to let's say RSVPTE where you just have per hop, uh, per flow or per tunnel as they call it there steering. You also have to have a per packet read calculate write update cycle at line rate that's that's the hard part of the shaper and that was a little bit too fast next slide and we want this and glbf gives you this same controller same calculation of latency same admission mechanisms but you don't need to do anything on the intervening hops you're maintaining the calculated uh, bandwidth that each of these flow takes and you don't have any per hop per flow state that you need to update from the control plane or where you need to have a cross packet high uh, performance uh, update of, of memory state. Next slide. Okay, um, right, that's what I said. Um, cost feasibility, I said, so the two problems, right, the control plane and the, the uh, high speed write uh, cycle. Next slide. Okay, this is the second thing. Why is it so cool to be always on time as opposed to be as early as possible? This is the long explanation about the fact that in industrial setting and many other settings, you have synchronous traffic. And the fact that the network is synchronous reduces the need to have on the application devices complex things such as a, P, uh, uh, a time synchronization engine or um, coupled with that play out buffers. So you make the application a lot easier when you have synchronous packet delivery in the network. Next slide. Right, so you don't need the clock synchronization on the application side and you don't need that buffering, which depends on the network side. We had a lot of equipment, which was working great. Customers set up boxes, they brought them into a larger network and they weren't working anymore because, oh, the playout buffer is too small. Why didn't tell us anybody that if we have a larger network, we need more buffers? And why the heck do we need it? Why can't the network do the buffering for us? Next slide. So why don't we do uh, dampers with any queuing and scheduling? Next slide. And that is pretty much if we don't have a standardized calculus to calculate the per hop latency, we can't to do things. We can't build a standardized controller and we also can't uh, basically um, uh, figure out how to do hardware fast, high speed and low cost implementations. Next slide. Right, so that's what this says. Next slide. Right, so positioning, um, and so go to the, the, the explanation, right? The, 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 the long presentation slide has the example of how to convert this into high speed, low cost implementations, either with PFO, long term or short term. We've got a workaround with FIFOs, which will work, uh, which is not ideal, but uh, which would work. But in general, we're positioning this as a long term solution. We think uh, TCQF, CSQF are perfect starting points. 
Um, this can be a great, you know, second generation replacement. It always takes longer to do packet header. We need packet header stuff anyhow. So this is not meant to uh, compete in the same uh, timeline as TCQF, CSQF, but succeeded and basically merged then the benefits, what we get with this solution, with the benefit of what we get from UBS. Next slide. Validation. Um, yep, so simple uh, simulation, right? We don't have high-speed validation. We did the simple uh, validation to actually show that just on a single hop, we have exactly that problem. If we don't do a shaper or a damper, we will exceed the guaranteed easily calculated latency. And then if you insert the damper, then you will get it back. Next slide. And that's, uh, you know, the upper one. The vertical bars that go across the horizontal line, those are the poor packets where kind of the... Um, burst aggregation across a single hop, uh, invalidated your mathematical simple model, and then you do the shaper, and then you see that through the queue, you're again uh, staying within the bounds. Um, so that was the simple validation. That's the high level uh, pitch for GLBF. Questions? Okay, there is one. Yeah, oh, there is a question, yes. Hi, uh, Thomas. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, so I just ask a uh, uh, simple question that uh, uh, does the GLBF require the worst case delay, for example, max as uh, uh, defined in your document, uh, the worst case delay um, for each hop to be the same. Uh, otherwise, it may be necessary to cover multiple different uh, What's case M in the packet? Thank you. I'm not sure I fully understood it, but you can, for example, configure GLBF to have exactly the same timing as a TCQF by just making the um, queue, the FIFO queue on every hop as large as your cycle time, for example. And, and that's in the draft and the, and the longer presentation. But I'm not sure if it's answer your question. Otherwise, let's take it to the list. Maybe it's easier there. Uh, Okay, I, I will send the mail list uh, about this question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Daniel Huang, ZTE, um, two comments. Uh, the first one is uh, when it comes to um, a particular situation, well, a lot of flows uh, um, have to be uh, released into the scheduler. Um, so there's the, um, extra latency incurred for the last flow. Uh, when the latency is big enough, uh, it has to be carried in the packets. Uh, but, but, but in your in, in draft, the uh, max Q is about the latency from the upstream and um, Q latency rather than the, the um, extra latency incurred from the damper last, last flow. So Again, I, I, I hope I understood the question correctly. I think this is a problem that, of course, we would be inheriting from UBS, right? Um, and I think we also have solutions for that. Um, in the frame interleaving, I'm uh, going to show first how we're uh, uh, planning to support that with TCQF. And I'll get to the, I think, GLBF solution for that next IETF. I didn't get everything done. Hi, right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a, a second comment. Uh, actually, I, I, I want to make a clarification for um, Shaf's comments, because mm -hmm. maybe the, 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 the audio is not, not good. Uh, it seems that we have to as, um, assume um, the worst case the latency from each top, each, each top is the same. Otherwise, uh, the different um, uh, worst case the latency has to be no, carry, no. Carry the, the, the big benefit of this solution over TCQF and all the other cycle mechanisms is that the per hop latency can be determined by the controller, by the uh, sizing of the buffer as they like, independent of on the other hop. That is one of the big uh, benefits of flexibility that we gain. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, did we skip over one? I think you've skipped, maybe? Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I... it's uh, number eight. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Gino. Gino Zhao. Uh, uh, this one is the new draft uh, called Latency Guarantee with Stateless Fair Queuing. 
Actually, this draft uh, was included in the another draft called uh, Asynchronous Deterministic Networking Framework. Um, but for the uh, but through the uh, the working group discussion, it was extracted as a new draft. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is the contents I will talk about today. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the overview of the draft. Uh, it first introduced about the fair king schedulers in general and the assumptions made in this draft. And finally, the details of the uh, work conserving stateless core fair king called uh, syscore is described in detail. The framework and the end to end latency bound uh, that is already covered in the ADN framework document. And the operational procedure in detail is described, but um, some of the subsections from uh, 3.1 3 to 3.4 has been already covered in the data plane open working meeting uh, in April. So I will just skip that part. The, uh, the two considerations for the implementation has been uh, added in this draft um, as a new item. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the basic framework of the so-called CIS-Core, which stands for Work Conserving Stateless Core Fail Queuing. Here, the finish, cult, uh, finish time, FT, plays the very important role, which plays uh, as a service order of the packets. In basic, the smaller FT gets earlier service. At the entrance node zero, the FT is been, has been is, uh, is calculated based on the flow state. But at the core node, those, the FT is updated by the D sub H uh, minus one P, you know, which, is, which is called delay factor. So uh, in core node, the flow state doesn't need to be uh, maintained. And the uh, scheduler works in work conserving manner. Whenever there are packets in the queue, the link never idles. And uh, the packets in the queue are served in the ascending order of the FT. These are the basic framework. And if, if the delay factor function is specified with that uh, red letter, then the end to end latency is bounded with that uh, equation. Uh, that equation will be covered later in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. This is the graphical uh, explanation about the framework just I mentioned. The flow on the observation, the package from the flow on the observation travels from node zero to H, and the entrance node keeps the flow state, but the core nodes are stateless. Uh, next slide, please. And this operational procedure already, I already covered in the previous uh, uh, open meetings. So um, yeah, uh, the details I won't go uh, Explain. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, from here, uh, this is a new stub I want to elaborate um, with some extent. So I, I would like to make you understand the end-to-end -end latency bound of the C-score uh, in more detail. In order to do that, uh, I, I would like to uh, I, I would like you to understand the concept of the ideal flow isolation. The ideal flow isolation uh, is achieved by a scheduler, which serves the flow as if there's no other flow in an imaginary link whose capacity is equal to the allocated service rate R to the flow. So in general, the, the flows are contending to be served by a single server or scheduler. But uh, in the ideal situation, the flow is isolated uh, with own, its own link, but the link capacity is uh, shrinked to the uh, allocated service rate. In this case, the latency of a bound is the function of the flow's own parameters. And given as that, um, the B here, large B is the maximum burst size, the large L is the maximum packet size, and the small R is the allocated service rate to the flow. And if you, it will be better understand if the B is L, that is, uh, there is no uh, significant burst. 
So only the single packet comes in a while. Then that D is uh, uh, bounded by its own transmission delay only, right? So this is clear. But for a network with I, uh, ideal flow isolation scheduler, the latency bound of that network is not the sum of the latency bound of each node. You have to understand that. Uh, if you see that uh, equation, inequality, the large H is the number of hopes. So it is, um, it is multiplied, the L divided by R, the transmission delay is multiplied by H, but the burst part is not multiplied by H. It is so-called pay burst only one's property. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this becomes more <laughs> complicated. But anyway, um, if I go through this slide fast, the, the figures at the right describe the worst case that can happen in a node. The, the each flow uh, generate the maximum burst at once, and the flow on the observation uh, generate the burst, but um, with a slightly less, a slightly later than those other flows. In this case, if the FIFO scheduler is used, as you can see, the blue, uh, blue packets are merged together. And you can see that uh, the length of the largest blue area becomes larger. That we call burst accumulation. Okay, so the burst can be accumulated in FIFO scheduler. But, but with the TDMA or the Fairking or uh, C-score that we are using, we are proposing, does not have that uh, bad uh, attitude, bad behavior. So the packet interleaves or dispersed evenly. So in conclusion, the Fairking or the C-score isolates flow almost perfectly with efficiency, robustness, and statistical multiplexing gain. And here, the, the C-scores end-to-end latency bound can be given like that, which is almost ideal, but uh, with the addition of L max divided by a large L. L max here is the uh, maximum packet length over all the flows sharing that link, and large R is the link capacity. So this term is due to the non-preemptive nature of the Fairking scheduler. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, up until here, uh, I have described the end of latency bound given by the C-score, the, the advantage of the C-score. But anyhow, there are two considerations we have to take into account. First one is that the entrance node has to keep the flow state. That's the disadvantage of this approach. But, any, but in somehow, this can be mitigated by, for example, uh, stateful source itself can act as the entrance node. The, so the node knows uh, what kind of packet it generates. So it can generate the uh, finish time and mark them as mark it as uh, metadata as in the packet and send into the network. Then it becomes the net network itself becomes stateless. Next slide, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next slide, please. And another consideration is the uh, time difference between nodes. So the finish time has to be somewhat um, cooperated, but the network node can have different clock. But you, we can cooperate those time difference, including the propagation delay, can be compensated. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, this is the conclusion. According to the requirement document, I have made a uh, check and remark. As you can see, all, I think all the requirements can be met except the 3.3. Three, three. It is to accommodate the higher link speed. Um, we have to use particle, yes. Uh, up until now, I think that uh, two clock, per two clock, in Q and DQ operation can be uh, done with the so-called pipeline the hip. Yeah. It can be seen in the next page. Thank you. Yeah, this 
you, you can skip. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. While the yeah. next uh, speaker is coming up, you can ask a quick question. <laughs> and... Right. So uh, I think the, the, the one thing where we may be misaligning in the comparison of the different mechanisms, the latencies that we're calculating that we're interested in is the latency we can guarantee not only when the flows that are currently in the network um, are all sending traffic, but when all the maximum number of possible flows that we even want to admit in the future are all sending the maximum amount of traffic, right? So yeah. that so I we're going to have to discuss it on list. And yeah, yeah. And we, we, I'm sorry, we're yes, out sir. of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, just remember, offline, just offline remember discussion. as your time is counting down, that includes time for questions. Sorry uh, about next that. Next speaker is uh, Rubin. Uh, hi, I'm a new face here. Welcome. So um, please forgive me, take a little time uh, to introduce myself. Uh, uh, who is H3C? <laughs> H3C was uh, Huawei and the 3Com joint winter. Uh, now, uh, um, it's, a, it's an old story and a long story. Now, uh, uh, new is 3C is the same company of 3C. So we now, uh, H3C is a subsidiary of HP. Um, uh, H3C gave me my star um, uh, of, uh, at the year of 2004, uh, I have been working in H3C uh, almost 20 years. I mainly focus on IP forwarding, MPS, uh, in switch research and development. Uh, that's all. Uh, now we get to the, 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 the draft. Uh, the, the, the draft uh, aim to uh, solve the critical challenge uh, of, uh, of jet reduction in the scale uh, deterministic network. Uh, we know uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the scale Deterministic network, we have a lot of problem will caught uh, caught data. That may be uh, scaling, traffic admin control, uh, queuing, and the forwarding mechanism. Uh, also, um, follow up aggregation may get. Uh, uh, make, uh, make generate data. So uh, the 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 data will add up when the app flow uh, span multi data uh, data network. Uh, so we next slide. So. We uh, we propose the uh, 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 we want to clock a reference plane to provide uh, 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 a curate a certain curate uh, uh, clock for each domain to enhance the uh, the control data, the control plan that. Uh, uh, provide a time synchronizing within each domain. Next slide, please. Um, we, we use the uh, compression node with, with, uh, with, uh, with to the listener um, who can uh, who can calculate the, the, the package 
uh, the package who transmitting from the from from the the uh, uh, who transmitting from the domain. So we 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 composing the uh, the the value. Um, uh, we use the the sorry. Uh, the mechanic um, calculate uh, composition value based on reference delay and the actually transmitting delay. And the uh, composition for transmitting delay at the composition node to efficiently reduce the data. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the mechanism have many benefit. Uh, first one, the time synchronizing is not uh, uh, required within each detonated domain. Uh, it's not only between the detonated domain. Secondly, uh, the egress and the egress node collect the actually transmitting delay in each domain. So we no need uh, any, uh, any, any, any do in the, in the, in the P node. Second, thirdly, the composition transmitting delay at the composition node connected to the listener. Next slide. Uh, in closing, we the draft uh, proposed a new method of package queuing and the scheduling, uh, scheduling of a composite node could successfully reduce data. Thank you for your attention. Uh, questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Corliss, I think you're back again. Okay, so this was the um, additional thing that came to mind working on all these uh, per hop mechanisms um, and trying to explain uh, some of the things uh, that, that, that were missing and then also the uh, TQF. Next slide. Sorry, this is not as nice a uh, um, eye candy as, as the previous slides. I'll, I'll promise I'll, I'll do better slides for some intermediate. So in TSN, we have this thing called gates, which um, at the edge of the network on ingress can be programmed to allow for whatever packets you classify to let them in starting at exactly now, up to now. And then uh, now again. Now again, so basically very accurate timing of this and um, there are multiple use cases, right? So um, <clears throat> it is actually the base mechanisms by which um, CQF in TSN is being built, right? CQF is not a novel mechanism, it's just a configuration of these gates. Um, the interesting stuff for us, which we don't have a dedicated solutions for right now and which I think is a missing building block in the DeadNet architecture is what I would call um, gates as a function the same way as we do, you know, the, the pre-off um, elements to enable flow interleaving. There may be other uses. Um, the folks with TSN experience might jump in and say what it could be good for. Um, uh, we, we probably want to use exactly what TSN has been doing there and see how we adopt it so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel for this. Um, so it shouldn't be that much work other than good document work to, to define them. Um, and so this draft is just meant to uh, make the argument that we need this in the DeadNet architecture for the flow interleaving. Next slide. So the, the use cases are really, um, we want to maximize the possible DeadNet utilization in a network, DeadNet traffic utilization in a network while maintaining minimal end-to-end -end queuing latency. 
right? And the benefits of this mechanism is proportional to the number of hops. So the larger the network is, large rings in a metropolitan access area or so, um, and also then uh, based on different type of speed links. Um, and this works best um, with uh, mechanisms that have on-time delivery like TCQF, CSQF, um, and we actually, I, I actually started to add this to those drafts and then I, I figured it's much better if we have it really as an independent component. Next slide. Now, the point is this is not depending on these mechanisms. It just works best with them. So this is the example use case. Um, metro metropolitan access ring, I've seen these to have as many as 20 or 30 routers in, in areas like India. So now you consider that you have these microsecond area cycles, but then you have flows which are in the order of milliseconds when they send their packets because they're, for example, based on remote driving. You have 50 frames per second video that you steer. So you need to send for every frame that you have, let's say, one round trip to update uh, all the status. So in the order of millisecond, and you have thousands of these flows. Um, for you know all these cars that are driven around the city from people sitting at home. Um, and now you ask yourself, what latency can I guarantee? And when you look at the models, then it is basically the low rate doesn't help you. The problem is each of them may have a 1500 byte packet. And worst case, you're adding up per hop um, a queue that consists of 1500 bytes times 20,000. So it's going to be way too long. So the only way you can do that is what you can call coordination of these flows, interleaving. You're basically within, let's say, every 10 millisecond interval, each of these flows need to be sent into the network at a particular uh, 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 offset within the 10 millisecond. And then you can you know, increase the capacity of that net traffic that you can serve at the same latency by a factor of 100 or up to 1,000 versus the microsecond that you have without uh, gaining additional per hop latency, right? So now this interleaving, next slide. Um, and I was talking about this. Um, next slide. Um, okay, I'm, I think I'm missing a little bit where I was trying to, to, to say the thing. Um, I hate slides when they're not following what I want to say. Um, who wrote these slides? Um, so there, there are really two interleaving cases of interest, right? So the one interleaving case is you just have the same entry and exit point, and you're just aggregating these flows, right? So you have thousands of these flows, but they're all from here to there. So on this point, you're aggregating these flows by giving each flow a particular offset in time when its burst goes into the flow. And you have the aggregated flow, and this now has a, a not higher burst, but just a higher rate. At any point in time, there's only one packet of 1,500, but the frequency at which they come is much higher now because you've aggregated 100 flows. So you have 100 times uh, the, the bit rate, right? And you can do this aggregation with any of our per hop uh, forwarding mechanisms, right? So it doesn't have to be TCQF or any of other our cool mechanisms. You can use the whatever worst thing, let's say RFC 2212, right? So insert from 1995 or so. This works for all of them. Now, only when you get to the point of You've got uh, some flow coming from here, and it goes along here, and this, the slides don't have the nice picture, right? If you're interleaving these multiple flows somewhere in the network, then your per hop mechanism needs to work together with this, right? So that you have the accurate on-time per hop forwarding that allows you to pre-calculate the interleaving within the network. Right. So now proposals that basically say we must have this flow interleaving gate on ingress be coupled with a per hop forwarding ignore the fact that for the simple point to point case, it's completely independent. Right. And I think that's an important case for us as well, because that for many deployments may already give you enough of the uh, increase in performance in, in utilization, the dead net uh, to make the gates worth their while. And that is exactly what I'm trying to say here. Um, we can use it with TSN ATS, with any of these uh, mechanisms, just for the hop end-to-end point-to-point aggregation. Um, it's just not going to work well if we do the interleaving of different flows in the middle of the network. That's when we need the better um, on-time mechanisms <coughs> like TCQF. Next slide. 
Right, and so when we compare our TCQF and CSQF, that's also when we have a difference in how well they can be used in conjunction with uh, this uh, flow interleaving. And so there is a, a chapter of that, it's, it's quite complicated, where you can understand that CSQF can make it easier to avoid that you're overloading individual cycles um, along the path because you can uh, kind of uh, allocate cycles adjacent to each other much more easily, right? So how much worth is it? Difficult to say, so we're still in the evaluation, but the reason of being able to distinguish performance of TCQF versus CSQF had me talk about that flow interleaving. Next slide. Yep, so pretty much I think, think of gates as another, whatever we want to call it, you know, uh, interleaving function or so, pre of I or so, the, the total set of functions that we want to have at some point in the network, in this case on ingress, right, um, as a separate function for flow interleaving um, as an orthogonal aspect. And uh, I hope I'll, I'll have better visual slides. There are all these wonderful slides that show how autonomous cars are interleaving so that you don't have to have red lights. And I couldn't find a good, and I'm not even sure if you can show video here, totally different question, but it's, it's so easy to see that in many other places, they're kind of looking into exactly this to get low latency with high utilization. Um, Janos, please. Yeah, I wanted to reflect uh, to earlier statements and also here in the last uh, summary slide that the DevNet Charter uh, states common architecture between the DevNet Working Group and uh, into 2020 TSN Task Group. And uh, mm -hmm. on the TSN side, uh, effort has been done to make the TSN QoS features available for non-bridge devices. I give more, more to the chat. There is an almost done or a project, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, whose goal is uh, that folks do not need to open up the 2000 pages of A2.1Q, but extract these QoS features and make it available for routers, firewalls, and so on. So we may rethink how to commonly use uh, these QoS features in that net and the TSM-like ecosystem. Yeah. But that's and I was hoping, right. yeah, and I was thinking maybe just that when we do our Yang models, we also have the Yang model so that you have a consistent provisioning API or something like that, whatever the minimum is that we need to do so that you have a consistent DeadNet operations and provisioning experience. Dan um, Bogdanovich, could you please back go to your use case slide where you have the topology? Yep. I just have a question about that one. More? More, more. It's just more, like... More. This one. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that in a meta ring, you're mm -hmm. expecting here to have like 30 hops? I, I, I've seen that in India. Uh, so usually in the comment... Uh, you can negotiate me, rate me down to 20? No. So number <laughs> one, it's the what they will be doing. They have, you know, they, they don't make round robin. They have like, you know, cross connects to shorten the times. And for the meta rings, usually... I don't see that you'll be doing IP hop by hop. They will, pro you know, usually they will provide an optical link between the endpoints within the ring. So, I mean, that's, that's always the question, right? So what do you want to think that we never, never, ever need to look into when customers want to build these networks, right? I mean, I've, I've been, been dealing with the problem that even the 50 millisecond failover in SRP rings wasn't good enough because you couldn't build a ring between east and west coast of the US and you had to uh, subdivide in two rings and they were really annoyed about I'm, it. So I'm, I'm rather sticking with flexible solutions for whatever network I'm getting and I was trying just to give no, no. a good- Look, worst that's fine. Case. So you're just uh, I'm sorry, making yeah, a worst case scenario <laughs> We have to wrap up. Well, wait, wait. Uh, that's a good discussion. Shafu was in line. Let's just go to. Yeah, yeah. I was... <laughs> uh, sorry, I have a, I have a question. That, uh, okay, based on the idea of flow interleaving, uh, it seems that uh, the forwarding plane uh, does not actually need to do anything uh, because, uh, yes. Um, yes. because the flow uh, interleaving, yes, you, 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 you. You know that uh, you only need to provide a single path. The 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 forwarding plane needs to allow you to predict the time when packets are at a particular hop in the network, so that you can plan the interleaving. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Rubin. Uh, again, my 
Uh, my name is Yugin from HCC. Uh, the, the draft they have presented on the last, uh, uh, last meeting. So we, I have presented here again. Uh, we know in the in scale network DeepNet, uh, no linear topology will make a Q resource conflicting problem more difficult to solve. Uh, when this, uh, we, uh, when conflict happen on the convex point, change the plan cycle of the head and the perform cycle calculator to its element the cleansing. Uh, next slide. So we propose the, uh, so uh, we propose the, uh, our VPFC planning information model derived from the uh, real V network uh, timetable concept uh, with which uh, efficient manager resource to solve the conflict. The model ensures the resource plan model meet the requirement of CSQF. TSQF or time slot. On VPF, v, what you periodic forwarding pass is a forwarding pass that support uh, cycling based forwarding and uh, have map relationship between uh, the schedule cycle of upstream and the downstream node. VPFC is established just like a tunnel of VPFC and uh, it has a unique identity, cycle information and uh, association bandwidth reservation. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, that many can, can provide uh, many benefit. Uh, first, uh, to re uh, realize the resource plan model as a part of uh, data net control plan, which can meet uh, requirement of CSQF, TSQF, or time slot. Secondly, we only need the head node of VFP schedule the date of the data net flow according to the cycle resource owned by VPFC with data net flow belong, belongs. Resor second, uh, thirdly, resource reservation uh, cycling and uh, transpa transparent for network node. So we make the implication of the resource reservation for data plan device as lightweight and stateless as possible. So finally, VPFC is a, like a tunnel. It can be uh, set by micro airflow. Next slide. Um, we have uh, update from the last meeting. Um, we welcome the T. Xunquan as a, a co author. And uh, we change the, the draft standard to information. Um, we have changed the uh, is a part of our control plane uh, as a VPFC plan information mode to enhance your control plan. Uh, third, we tend to uh, some introduction uh, and uh, redefine 
the forwarding path and the model find the define of VPFP. Next slide. Um, our next step is extend the, the extend the, the plan model to improve resource utilization efficiency and uh, add uh, description of config information model for the swag mode. That's all. You, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Comments? Okay, we're going to move on to the last speaker. <coughs> and uh, we do expect to poll at the end of this, uh, uh, at the end of the slide. So please scan in and be ready for that. Hi, everyone. I'm Kiran from Futureway, and I'm presenting the second version. I Just am making sure everyone's awake. It's good. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> well done. <laughs> I'm just going to hold it in my hand now. Um, so this is the second version of um, this proposal. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the bigger changes that we added a new author, Lewis, um, is a co-author for this draft now. And a quick recap to our problem space. Uh, we are working on providing an interface from application to deterministic networks. And we felt that it was underspecified as per the DeadNet architecture. Um, our current, so my biggest motivation is how can we do remote process automation? So our focus is on applications that are sitting in some kind of a softwares and programmable domain and they can control your sensors and actuators on the other side on the factory floor. So the main focus is from application to um, .NET Relay node because we consider .NET Relay node will be the edge of the network. Next slide, please. And um, we are looking for some kind of a programmable interface. So if you want to do automation, the pace at which you want to move your machinery or uh, some other parts of your factory floor, they would dynamically change. So having a programmable interface is really useful. And in order to do that, we use, um, we make an assumption that uh, applications are running IPv6 because it is pretty difficult to extend IPv4 now. And so it makes a lot of sense to use uh, extension headers in, um, and spe specifically hop by hop extension header. And what that format will look like is presented here in this slide. So the way we go about it is that we identify a set of traffic patterns that are relevant for process automation and how they can be reflected through this extension header. So that's the general idea. I'm not going to go into the details of the extension header. We can have that discussion on the mailing list. Um, next slide, please. So those are the things we did not change. And these are the updates since uh, we spoke in March. Lewis is now co-author, and he is interested from the effort that is done on Predict 6G and Desire 6G. And one of his major feedback was that instead of just looking at this um, traffic patterns, the requests we are sending from application to DeadNet, maybe we will need to add some more information or maybe we want to extend this extension header. I kind of paused on it that let's see how this draft works and then we can start adding um, other elements of um, requests that we need to send maybe. And one thing is right now, I'm just talking about the request that will go from application to .NET. There is also a possibility that um, the relay node could send inform some information back to application in order to express some error or some other state changes that happened in network and application may be interested in. And informally cross-check. Yeah, so second point is quite interesting. I don't know about this room, but I've been shopping around and speaking to IPv6 experts and I asked them that, hey, I'm using this hop by hop option 
do you think it's the right way to go about it or I'm doing something wrong about it? And so far, I have got very positive feedback. Uh, most of the people are telling me that it is an interesting use case, a very interesting use case, how you are using um, extension headers for this work. And then um, there was a very comprehensive review from Florian. He actually went through line by line of document and provided me comments how this document can be improved. Um, to the extent that it was very hard to provide all the answers in a comprehensive way, I created a Google Doc link and we exchange information through there. And uh, I actually invite all of you to just go and comment on those, uh, on, yeah, just let's comment and resolve those issues on this Google Doc. Or um, another approach I'm taking is picking up one topic and bringing it to the mailing list and discussing it with the team. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the major changes that um, there was, controller term was kind of confusing um, because we are in ITF and network, and normally people confuse controller with network controllers. So I started using term process controller, but I spoke to someone um, yesterday and they are not satisfied with this term either. So things will evolve and suggestion was that maybe industrial controller is a better term than using process control. And uh, there was a contention on the terminology cloud. So I tried to remove all the instances of cloud from the document because there is no way I was implying you would do uh, remote process automation from a public cloud. It could be your enterprise cloud, some private cloud, or maybe just your applications are remote from your factory floor through a van or some other mechanism where DeadNet is deployed. So I took care of uh, that part of terminology. And um, there was an interesting question from Florian that how do you perceive where your process controller is sitting with respect to applications. Um, is your process controller part of application or is it a separate entity? So I've tried to explain it by adding a communication model in section 3.2. And so the general idea is we consider it as a functionality or a logical function point. And by doing that, we make things quite simpler and whether they should reside with applications or outside applications, that should not be a concern to us. We are only providing an interface for um, operation and control functions to the de deterministic network. Uh, since we discussed, uh, there is, um, yeah, there was, a, I, since I was looking for all the traffic patterns and looking for end-to-end -end communication also, I inserted a text on transport protocols that TCP UDP may not be suitable for, uh, pro for operation and control, but I found those things are outside the scope of this document. And in next revision, I will remove them and clean that part up. Then there are some editorial set of changes that will be very easy to see through the dips. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, generalized uh, communication model and we added in section 3.2. So it might help us with some terminology also, the confusion between process controller, network controller, industrial controller. Let's say I have a DetNet and I just provide logical points that uh, OC point is operation and control point. So in my mind, it covers a lot of scenarios where process automation, industrial automation, or any kind of OT related functions are involved. So we can call that OC point and things, the traffic patterns that are related to sensors type of devices, they can be called sensor point. And then similarly for actuators, we can call actuation points. The major differences between read, write and the traffic patterns for sensors are more interval based and like pulses going out from the sensors. And for actuation, it is writing onto the devices with certain latency constraints. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the next steps are um, 
we want to look into OCN options in a more comprehensive way, for example, this is something I want to get a feedback from the group. Would it be viable that we can have also communication back from the DetNet Relay node to the application in terms of if there are any errors that we want to indicate back? And um, another thought that came to my mind was that we have the notion of service sublayer in DetNet. And that was supposed to be implemented on the DetNet end stations. Can we use this effort to define um, service sublayer in a more comprehensive way? But that's just a raw thought. I'm not too bound to it. Something that work group, uh, working group can think about. And um, how, uh, yeah, so there is one part. So we, we are using extension header to express applications requirement to the deterministic network. How relay node on the DetNet will translate it, we haven't covered that part. It is more like a software and implementation issue. So that part is outside the scope of the document. And I just wanted to highlight that. So more comments and feedback. This time I got more time to talk about the internals of the document. Last time I was just focused on the motivation part. And I'm scared, but is work group adoption, is it premature to ask for it? Or um, should I do that? <laughs> well, what, let's see what the comments are. You're always free to ask. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, uh, uh, let's, let's uh, we have Janos and Torlis in queue. Yes, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, if uh, operations technology experts, like industrial automation experts, uh, are interested, involved, expressed, uh, this is a good way to go because, uh, or is it just networking experts trying to do something uh, without the involvement of industry automation experts? I have not seen industry automation experts on the list or in the draft. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. How do we get feedback from the experts because those guys are not here? If you have any ideas, do let me know. Um, I, I can tell you that Florian is involved in some type of OT uh, networking. And uh, he did thorough review of this document. So we can at least say that there's one person who's involved on the OT side has looked into it. I was just talking with uh, somebody working with industrial networks and he said the IETF was so lovely to them when they had a draft that said industrial FUBAR, um, reviewers came back and said, hey, if it's industrial networks, go away. This is the internet, uh, go to an industrial forum. So it's, but yeah, uh, talk to me, I'll, I'll see. Um, I wanted to get to the one point um, about uh, the packet header that you were saying, right? So maybe as a general comment, not only to you, but I think we have so many different of these proposals that ultimately will end up requiring something in the, de in, in, in the packet header. And maybe we, you know, the co-authors of these different documents could come together and just, you know, do, do something of this, this goes nowhere, but this would be a draft to put all these things that we potentially from DetNet, from our proposals, want to have in the header so that we can engage with MPLS and six men and ask them what in general do they want us to, to do so that when we actually, you know, probably much later, um, come to them with a, with a real working group conclusion that we don't at that point in time need to start from zero the discussion with them about how to exactly do it in the encapsulation. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, only thing is you also mentioned MPLS. And since I'm looking from the application side, I don't assume they would use MPLS directly from the end station. That's one of the reasons we wanted to introduce uh, extension headers with IPv6. Oh, no, that's fine. I mean, we have these these big religious uh, you know, sites, one for IPv6, one for MPLS, I think. Um, the, the MPLS side, actually, there is a MPLS in the Linux um, uh, kernel, right? So you can buy um, um, network function elements that directly do MPLS as well. So I'm okay. trying from, from the DeadNet head where we started with MPLS and, and hopefully doing more for SRV6 now in the work as okay. well. I'd love to stay neutral there. So what you're saying is very close to this point number two that 
should we specify service sublayer more comprehensively? Yeah, no, I, I also think that in yeah. something like the industrial stuff, I'd be surprised if MPLS takes a role. But I was saying, let's take the, the header, uh, you know, have mm -hmm. a have a yeah. joint discussion between what we may want to have from DeadNet with the header folks that are responsible, six men and MPLS. Yep. Okay. Um, while you are always welcome to ask for adoption, and many do, I, I think it's a little early, and actually Janos agrees, uh, for adoption, but what we do want to ask, and this is a, there's three ways to answer this question, even though the raise hand tool says raise or lower. Um, we're interested in if the group is interested in hearing more on this topic. You know, is this something we should keep discussing? And raise your hands if you are and you've read the draft. Lower your hand, so do not raise hand if you're interested and have not raised and have not uh, read the draft. And come to the mic or join the queue if you'd like to object, because we'd like to hear why. So if you participate in the poll, you're saying, yes, you want to work on this, or you would like to hear more. If you think you don't want to hear more, don't participate, or even better, come to the mic and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't be talking about industrial applications, although that's what DebtNet's all about. But, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be talking about it here on the internet. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're, this is actually the reason we phrased it this way. We suspected there would be general interest, but not a lot of people have read the draft. And that's, I think, what this is uh, showing. Although, you know, the, the numbers are less than a third of the people in the room. Um, so uh, we'd love to hear if anyone wants to uh, join the queue and object. Well, that's great. It's a nice to end without any objections. So there's definitely interest to keep hearing more. So please discuss on the list. Please read the document. <laughs> Use your opportunity and comment on the list. And we will see you all tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much for a, a good session and all the good contributions. Thank you, Janos. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all.